activists, front lines of struggle, uh, key issues and advances in the struggle for human rights in California. Uh, with our plenary, first thing I want everybody to know that we made a few changes. Um, and if I get the changes wrong, uh, I have no problem being corrected, all right? So uh, folks correct me. But um, we're, we're going to start with uh, Brother Fani Baruti with All of Us or None uh, shortly. And then uh, Reverend Daniel Buford with the Michael John Civil Liberties Institute. Uh, and then we're going to go with uh, Kruti. Kruti, please pronounce your last name for me. I, I know I get mad when people mask your mind. Park, uh, who's with the Youth Justice Coalition, who's going to be supported by uh, Henry Sandoval, also with the uh, Youth Justice Coalition. And then we made a, a two switches to the program. Uh, Mark um, Anko, or uh, An Mark, I'm asking his name. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we'll be speaking tomorrow, so we're making a switch. And the reason for the switch is Radley Davis with the Pitt River Tribe and the International Indian Treaty Council is only here for a short amount of time. Uh, and we wanted to give some focus to uh, indigenous issues in California. And so we have a, a treat, a kind of a last minute treat. Uh, Radley's going to close us out, but we're also going to be, uh, as part of that closeout, watching a film uh, that's to give us a deeper sense of grounding of where we are, where we stand, and what the history is. Uh, it's a film called Gold, Greed, and Genocide. All right, some of you may have seen it. Uh, some of you may have not, but it, we're going to definitely look at it uh, to get ourselves a grounding in terms of what the history of indigenous people here is in California, uh, the history of the colonial uh, conquest and settlement, which is uh, one of the more brutal episodes in, in someone growing up here in Southern uh, California uh, and having some parents and folks involved in the social movement, I was blessed enough to be taught some of that history. When I know most of us is something that we're totally uh, denied any knowledge of. So we're going to do some exposure so folks have a understanding of where you are and where we stand. So uh, just one quick thing before we get started. Um, now folks, know that part of um, the reason why we're here in Los Angeles uh, is because we were boycotting Georgia. Uh, so you know, we left Georgia because uh, uh, they kind of think this is, I think, are trying to go back to the 1840s and 50s, um, you know, with these kind of slave catcher type laws that they you know, trying to institute. Uh, but we wanted to highlight a state that was moving in part the right direction. And I say in part, because uh, California has a long history of both some of the most progressive ideas that have come out of uh, you know, the United States in the past 50, 60 years. But it also has come out with some of the most reactionary figures and policies and laws as well. So there's progress and there's struggle at the same time. So we wanted to highlight a little bit of both. So the character of the program is kind of based in that, that respect. So um, I'll let the speakers get more into the depth of the issues that they want to talk about. But uh, in short, we're covering some of the human rights struggle that is taking place within the, the, the prison law in California. Uh, and folks should know, if you don't know, California has the largest prison development and concentration uh, per geographic region of any place in the world. Not just in the United States, in the world, right? So, something to be mindful of. So, Fine is going to break that down. Reverend uh, Buford is going to break down one of the, the success struggles that have taken place in terms of uh, beginning on the road towards both monitoring the state, monitoring its own activity, and influence on the implementation of the law that was passed here. Uh, and then the Youth Justice Coalition did a lot of dynamic work to do it here in Cal Southern California for years. So they're going to talk about some of that work and some of the things that they've been working on in the past. And then Mark is going to, I think, really touch on both the history but also the struggle of our civil sites in California, uh, which has actually been long gone. So, so uh, many of you heard me mention it before we even get started. Uh, uh, this is the 30th 
um, anniversary of Mumia uh, being incarcerated in, in Lancashire on death row today, uh, December 9th. And so we asked the brother, um, because there's an international kind of education piece that's going on and it really spread out of Philly. Philly's doing uh, Pam and Ramona uh, and, and their friends and family, Mumia Bujamal and the African family, they're doing some major activities in Philadelphia this weekend, otherwise they would be here with us. Uh, but we, we wanted to make sure we'll be his presence, we're here in the presence of, through him, uh, the presence of all our political prisons and prisons of war was a part of this gathering that's one of the central human rights struggles uh, that we're engaged in. And so Mumia blessed us with a small kind of greeting for the conference. We're going to play that before we go to uh, uh, Brother Fire. Dear conferees of the U.S. Human Rights Network in L.A., I greet you all, and I commend you on your work to raise the profile of human rights over that of civil rights. By so doing, you give life to the words of Malcolm X, al Haj Malik Shabazz, one of the most influential black leaders of the 20th century. Malcolm, especially in his latter years, strove mightily to bring the plight of millions of black Americans to the world's attention. Your work on behalf of the growing protests against Georgia's racist HB 87 extends Malcolm's work to Latinos and Latinas, and of course, other immigrants who face the frightening prospect of being demanded to produce papers, a scenario that is evocative of the Nazis. From Malcolm's time to this, human rights law has developed substantially. Although some Americans have decried this trend, they do so in the face of the U.S. Constitution's Article 6, which states that all treaties signed by the U.S. become the supreme law of the land. Now, we know that there's a long history of people and courts ignoring both treaties and the Constitution, but the Human Rights Network is on the right side of history. I'm certain Malcolm and other human rights activists would salute you in your efforts today, for it is against racism, against chauvinism, and for the freedom, dignity, and human rights of all humanity. I can dig that. On the move, long live John Africa. From death row, this is Mumia Abu. Jamal. Uh, what I'm going to be talking to you about tonight is um, the movement that's going on inside the prison system here in California uh, amongst those that's confined in the shoe, segregated housing units, and the disparities uh, that they're, and, and the atrocities that they're going through there. Um, on July the 1st, many of you should know that there was a hunger strike that commenced uh, amongst thousands of uh, these brothers inside the institution who had a five core demand uh, specifically toward um, their, their right to um, have adequate um, reading material, their right to um, be able to um, have human contact, the right to be able to not have to uh, debrief, which debriefing uh, was an element that you would have to have some information about somebody else that you knew who had criminal activity in their life. And when we talk about these brothers behind the wall, in the hole, in the dungeons, under torturous conditions, whose only human contact in many years have been uh, when the guards would come in to place handcuffs on them to take them out to the, to the yard, which is really not a yard, but uh, something um, concrete. We call it a, a small corridor, a concrete jungle, uh, where the walls is so high you don't see anything, you know. Um, <clears throat> The debriefing element has kept many of them inside for many, many years because they don't have any information. If you haven't been around somebody for 10, 15, 20 years, how are you going to give something to them? And this is uh, a rule that's regulated that if you want to get out, you have to bring up something. And so many of them are not able to debrief. The other conditions that they uh, talked about, many people in California, a lot of family members, 
and organizations, grassroots. Uh, went up to Sacramento to talk to, you know, the uh, legislators and the uh, uh, director of the CDCR concerning these matters. And so for 20 days, um, people put their lives on line uh, to dismantle torturous conditions. And we have to use that word because when we talk about torture, it's a mental thing. And uh, many of them, you know, think about committing suicide, uh, but many of them are strong enough to hold on, you know. And so when we talk about uh, them missing uh, the line of, of being able to communicate regularly with their family members or even with another inmate. Some of them haven't talked to to other people in, in years. And so can you just think about that psychological torture that's been placed on them? And so, you know, um, All of Us and None is an organization that has a voice for those that's inside. And uh, one of our members, Dorsey Nunn, was on the uh, the steering panel that kind of was was able to go inside the institution and talk to uh, the inmates and, and see what was going on with them and talk to uh, the officials. And so <clears throat> around about 20 days in, uh, there was some consensus that some of the demands would be met. And actually it wasn't. I mean, you know, they was just asking for a beanie. They was asking for a, a, a sweatsuit. You know, just minute things that um, um, that they that they deserve to have. Uh, one of the things that would take you into the shoe is reading material. Some of the books that that I've read that if they get caught reading on the main line, they can go into the shoe and with an indeterminate sentence. And so when we talk about the human rights of people uh, that's incarcerated, we wanted to try to get this message across the nation and internationally because those conditions are very harsh. And when we talk about people dying for a cause, they was ready. Um, they reconvened the uh, hunger strike and at that time they were threatened they were threatened uh, of, of, of all kind of uh, disciplinary actions against them and so I, I want to bring to your attention that when we talk about these type of conditions inside these institutions we have to understand that the CDCR has one of the most um, um, biggest unions in the world. The the Correctional Officers Union is very powerful. Uh, they have a lot of clout, you know, in 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 the uh, legislation. They bag a lot of people, and um, we need to do something about that. You know, we really need to do something about it. We really need to keep getting the word out as to what's really going on here, right here in the United States. Uh, California is a, is a state that what happens here basically dominoes effect in, 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 in the other uh, states across the country. I remember in 1994 when uh, the three strikes law was passed and how the advocation for that was was that, you know, uh, heinous crime, violent crimes, and so forth. But what has happened is that many of those people have been in for still in socks. Uh, if you remember the famous case, it was a, a piece, a piece of pizza. And we're talking about 25 years of life. And so um, as we go into this um, overcrowdedness that the California State Supreme Court said, I mean, the United States Supreme Court said that um, these conditions are, are horrendous and you have to do something about it. And so from the state down to the counties, uh, we're fighting real hard under uh, this bill that 
the governor signed AB 109. And I, I just think that across this country, if we don't look to California as, as, as having some changes going on, is that it's just going to get worse. We need, to, we need support from um, human rights activists across this country and, and abroad. Um, one of the other uh, major uh, components about this, uh, uh, the conditions behind the walls is that um, the communication element is, is very, very difficult for them to get out the words that they need to get out. Some things are coming out, but when we, you know, know that the conditions inside is so horrendous and so uh, the guards have a way of psychologically beating you down, you know. And the mainstream people hear the, the messages that, you know, these are the hardened criminals, they've done this, they've done that. And when you actually dig into what people have done, it's ridiculous. And so we're fighting real hard out here uh, as a voice for those inside, you know, to, to get the CDCR to uh, meet some of these demands. What, what, what they're afraid of is this, is that it's so much uh, going on inside that if they, they feel that if they give in, that more protests will come in from 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 other uh, portions of of the penal system here in California, and 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 even though that is to be true, I think that um, the more that we uh, support what's going on, the better the wording of what's going on will get out to change the minds of the people who don't really understand, but who will believe anything. Uh, that's coming from the higher echelon, you know. Uh, the director, Cates, he's, uh, he's a person that, um, wow, well, I don't even want to try to find a word to describe, you know, who this man is. But I, but I just think that as a human rights organization, when we talk about torturous conditions, especially to people who don't deserve what's going on. We really have to do something about it. I mean, you know, we, we can talk, people talk about what should be done. And I have worked around a lot of people who just talk and don't do too much of anything against what's going on. Of course, uh, we know that there has there the, the laws is here and they're gonna be here to stay, but we can do something about how we are treated. No matter what a person done, they're still a human being. That's first, and no one no one deserves to be treated treated like an animal. No one deserves to be treated as if uh, their existence means nothing. Uh, some people have been in the shoe for 35 years, 30 years, 25 years, 20 years. And I'm talking about a lot of people up under the conditions that are torturous, up under the conditions that um, has allowed them to have even some mental issues. And these are concerns that we have, and I just hope that you open your minds to uh, helping us to dismantle what's going on inside the shoes in here in California. And so this is a new movement that's going on. Um, when the second hunger strike came out, uh, they um, stopped Dorsey and uh, the, some of the lawyers from the uh, uh, Legal Services for Parents with Children of going inside. And uh, that's just a tactic that they're using to try to discourage outside help. So we need your support, and I hope that uh, you'll take consideration of what's going on there, and if you have any questions for me later, I will be uh, 
gladly to talk with you. Thank you. All right, thank you, Fanya. Next, we want to bring up uh, Reverend Daniel Buford with Michael John Civil Liberties Institute. Thank you, Brother Kali. <clears throat> um, I'd like to, uh, first of all, thank the, uh, the committee that organized this event and uh, give a shout out to uh, Brother John Mubaraka, who I see in the, uh, in the audience. And lots of other uh, friends that I uh, recognize from the Bay, both the Bay Area and um, from around the, the country. <coughs> what, um, what I've been invited to uh, talk to you tonight about is um, something that's called ACR 129. ACR 129. And what that means is, is that is, that is a, uh, a state legislature uh, document that is the Assembly Concurrent Resolution 129. Uh, it was passed with a 52 to 11 vote uh, in August of uh, 2010. And this particular uh, concurrent resolution was, uh, was sponsored and put forth by um, uh, Assemblyman Bill Monning, who is the representative for the 27th District, uh, I believe, which is Santa Cruz. Um, and he, uh, he sponsored this. Now, um, let me just say what this is about, <coughs> because um, as, uh, as has already been stated, um, California is off often sets the, uh, the pace and the precedent for much of, of what is good in the country, but we also know that it sets the pace for what is also bad in the country many times. In this instance, it is setting a pace for something that, uh, that should be good and is good because this, uh, this ACR 129 now makes California the first and only state in the United States that requires human rights reporting according to the treaty obligations uh, of the three treaties that the United States has signed on and ratified. I think we should, if we were in church, I'd say, let's give the Lord some praise, but y'all praise who you want to praise for. For, for that happening because uh, it took a, a lot of work and inspiration and some of you in this very room helped to be that inspiration and um, I uh, look at brother J Jamil uh, Dakwara back there uh, and, um, and and other people who I've been able to work with years ago and uh, just to bring it up real quick because uh, I don't have a whole lot of time to hold forth here um, I had the opportunity to uh, to present uh, a list of uh, complaints, if you will, before the United Nations Human Rights Committee uh, in, in March uh, 2006 uh, in New York City, and then again in July 2006 in Geneva, Switzerland. And the reason why I was there was is that uh, I was presenting a list of complaints uh, that had to do with the human rights violations experienced by people who uh, lived and died and were tortured in the aftermath of Hurricane Katrina. Mm -hmm. And so from out of that, uh, that initial testimony in March, they used my testimony somewhat as a template for cross-examining um, uh, people from the United States, I mean United States of America, <laughs> uh, who showed up in, um, in Geneva, Switzerland. Uh, that wasn't quite a Freudian slip because if you'd have heard the lies that they were telling in terms of uh, people who were displaced not being qualified under the UN definition of displaced persons, of, uh, of lying and saying that federal uh, law enforcement agencies don't do uh, racial profiling. <laughs> When's the last time the FBI stopped you for a traffic ticket? Hello. So they were being like snakes and they were obfuscating what the real issues were. Where a number of us who were in both uh, New York and Geneva, we, uh, we, we saw with these continual lies of the United States saying that they were doing all they could, but it was the state's problem. Like for instance, what happened in New Orleans, that wasn't us, that was the state, is what they were saying. Uh, many of us concluded that well, we had to go back and get the states to begin to adopt standards 
uh, that would uh, allow uh, them to do human rights reporting. And that was the inspiration for us, first of all, prodding the city of Berkeley to become the first city in the United States to uh, require this reporting. Back in 2009, they did this. And then, the, then we were able to uh, push this on at the state level. Now, let me just say something about having standards before I get into any, any details. That uh, we saw with, um, uh, basically, uh, uh, Brother Baruti just laid it out, really, about the um, legalized and institutionalized uh, torture in the concrete slave ships that are the penal institutions here in California. He's already laid that out. And many of us know that uh, many of the uh, uh, penal uh, guards, the prison guards, who eventually ended up in uh, Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib, uh, that they, uh, they learned their craft of torturing people and doing sensory de deprivation and uh, keeping people locked up for long periods of time in stress positions. They learned that in the U.S. penal system. They practiced that stuff on us, and then they went over there, and then they perfected it for all the world to see and now for people to know. Now, let me just say something about having a standard. We now have a standard, and we've had standards about human rights uh, and civil rights, but here's, here's where the danger comes in, and I hope that those of us who are, who are thinking and, and, and insightful can see into what I'm talking about here. In my opinion, I want the standards that have to do with human rights not to be uh, uh, applied equally. I don't want equality to be a part of the uh, application of the standards. I want equity to be part of the standard. As a matter of fact, I want equity to be the ground floor, not equality, but equity. What am I trying to say here? What I'm trying to say here is, is that if you start out with a low standard, and then you say, I want to be equal to that, where does that leave you? That leaves you low. So this is what we see that happened in Guantanamo and Abu Ghraib. These people had low standards of dealing with human beings, and so that low standard allowed them to treat all prisoners equally bad. So I'm not really a proponent of equality, because Don, Don Imus was a proponent of equality because he said that he talked about people equally bad. Uh, the Han Rabbit Code has to do with equality, but uh, it leaves you with an eye for an eye and everybody blind. So then there's something wrong with just fighting for equality, my friends. We're in a new century, and we have to step up our game beyond just responding to the dynamic set up by the Plessy versus Ferguson decision that said separate but equal. As long as we keep our argument in the equal versus unequal game, we will always come up short. Look at, look at the deliberate speed that our public school systems have been um, desegregated with and integrated with, with, uh, with, with equality. Look at the busing and equality. Look at jobs and equality. No, my friends, if we want to be treated anyway, we don't want to be treated equally. I don't want to be treated like poor white people are treated. I don't want to be treated like Native Americans are treated. I don't want to be treated like Mexicans coming over the border is tre are treated. I want to be treated better than that, and I want them to be treated better than that. So then we shouldn't stand for low standards <laughs> when it comes to human rights issues and human rights requirements. That being said, ACR 129 is only a set of codes. It's only a set of codes, but right now, it's like having a set of codes and we don't have any code enforcers. It's like having a set of building codes and you don't have contractors. And what we have to now do is to put the legislature into a posture and the state attorney general into a posture where she values enforcing these codes, not with equality, but with equity. Right now, Sister Kamala Harris, who we helped put in office, is dragging her feet on this ACR 129 business saying that they don't have enough money. But if somebody started strangling a whole bunch of folk and leaving dead bodies over the state, they would find the money 
to find that person. Hmm. And, and, and that's happening right now. But it's just happening through the judicial processes. It's happening through the institutional processes. And that's why we have to, uh, to rise to the occasion here. What if we had building codes for, for a building industry, but nobody who knew how to enforce them? What if we had building codes with, uh, with, with no one who could build according to that set of guidelines? What am I saying here? I'm saying that if we want people to be treated with humanity and with equity, that we must start in the school system. Somebody in here needs to write a curriculum that, uh, that will enable children to know how to treat each other as human beings from grade school. And that way, if, if, if teachers and students are, have that kind of curriculum, we don't have to worry about bullying so much right. and other forms of inhumane treatment that uh, the children and adults uh, uh, visit on each other. Police in their training need to know what our human rights are. Teachers in their training need to know what our human rights are. Social workers in their training need to know what our human rights are. Lawyers and legal workers need to know what our human rights are. And any group of people that I've ever spoken to on the issue of human rights, uh, maybe not in this group so much, but I can usually ask a question. I say, how many people in here are concerned about human rights? And, and, and only somebody that's a sociopath would not respond positively. People raise their hand. I say, so how many of you who are concerned about human rights know what those human rights are? what they are derived from, and then people can't raise their hand. And I'm going to close on this point, that if you don't know what your human rights are and where they're derived from, you won't know how to advocate for the people in the prison system that we've been talking about before. If you don't know what those rights really are, you won't know how that affects a case like the Oscar Grant case uh, in, um, in, in the BART uh, police issue. You won't know that what happened to the uh, students that were pepper sprayed uh, up at UC Davis, which was bad. That's no different than the pepper spraying of people who were incarcerated in the juvenile uh, system. That it was even that was brought before the United Nations Human Rights uh, Committee uh, long ago. One thing that I'm, I'm very happy about and proud of in my own little contribution uh, in terms of bringing forth. Uh, the human rights complaints about Hurricane Katrina, and I'll end on this point. One of the things that I mentioned in, the, in my, like, 12-page document was the fact that um, a number of uh, people had been shot by the police trying to uh, 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 obey a lawful order to evacuate the city of New Orleans, and the police had been involved in this, and police had been involved in the cover-up of it, and, uh, and, and that was presented before the United Nations Human Rights Committee in March 2006. We are just now seeing the aftermath of some of these trials where earlier this year the, uh, the guys that actually did the shooting uh, were, uh, were, were convicted. And now those who not only did the shooting but lied about it, they're in the last part of their judicial process. So I just conclude uh, on the notion to say that, um, that the California um, has, um, has a good thing going right now because we have these standards that are human rights standards, but they will be empty standards if we don't infuse them with, with, a, with an ethic that values equity. Thank you. Who are we? <laughs> so we have something called Chuco's Justice Center. Uh, at 1137 East Redondo, it straddles between Inglewood and South Central. It's not too far from here. If you have an opportunity, we want you to come and visit us. It's called the Movement Building Space. And I love All of Us or None. We've kind of been adopted as, as their children, right? It's the Youth Justice Coalition. It's not just a nonprofit, right? It's a movement. All of Us or None. Um, so today, uh, I apologize for any confusion around who's going to be speaking today. Um, Henry is uh, going to share with us where LA is, right? Because I agree with a lot of the, the speakers. In some ways, California is amazing. In a lot of ways, we've started things, unfortunately, that has been you know, exported to other cities and 
counties and states and countries uh, that we apologize for. Yes, exactly. Um, so without further ado, I want to uh, just introduce Henry Sandoval. He's one of our extraordinary youth organizers and a public ally um, at the YJC. I'm a youth organizer. Um, I'm, I'm 20 years old. The YJC's goal is to turn down a system that has ensured the massive lockup of people of color, widespread police violence and corruption, consistent violation of youth and communities' constitutional and human rights, the buildup of the world's largest network of jails and prison. We use the direct action organizing, advocacy, political education, and activist arts to agitate, expose, and annoy the people in charge in order to upset power and bring about change. LA's worth uh, war on youth. You could um, you could also hold up. <laughs> you could also call this free LA. Uh, if you say we we at the YJC say we we free LA, we save the world, because basically you know uh, other states have adapted our policies from the where we came from over here in Los Angeles. Um, when police, politicians, and the media talk about gangs in the late, they describe a hundred thousand gang members in LA County. In LA City alone, there are over seven hundred gangs with over fifty thousand members. Two hundred and fifty thousand people on Cal Gang statewide database. Uh, faults of youth and families. They do not talk about. The fact that these numbers refer to alleged gang members and that even the police admit that less, fi uh, less than 5% are committing violence. LA is number one nationally and worldwide to many things that harm young people. The historical roots of LA's violence, the failure of suppression to solve violence. The war on drugs is a war on youth. The war on gangs is a war on youth. LA lockdown. We are number one worldwide incarceration, prison spending, and prison population. Pornography production export, gang creation export, meth production export and import, export of five illegal drugs, handguns, white supremacy, gangs, and orgs. Uh, we are number one nationwide gap between rich and poor, homelessness, youth and foster care, riots, children, and people living in poverty. Immigration and deportation. From taking the land, uh, force, vegetate justice, mobile, uh, mobile violence, massacre, disease, starvation, burning people out. Uh, this is kind of like our history here. Uh, Displement legal legislative force as an opposed to military force, such as treaties, eminent domain, uh, falls, bribes, such as Section 8 and Hope uh, 6. Uh, gentrification, development, etc. Displacement is always into interior land area and into homes homelessness, deterioration, isolation. Okay, okay. Go ahead. You can keep going. Okay. Uh, uh, youth seen as rebels, radicals, and revolutionaries from the 1960s to the early 70s. I'm going to just break that down for you guys right here. Um, okay. U.S. policies that come out of L.A. Um, in the 1960s, the movement, uh, movement, the movement leads to mass incarceration of poor people and people of color. The population increases 300% in 20 years. System. Sorry, sorry, sorry. Um, so thank you very much, Grandma, uh, to mention Nixon and Reagan, right? Um, and then we see uh, Chief Parker also introduced military-style policing and brings uh, National Guards into Watts in 65. And then in 2007, Jordan Downs, which is one of our housing projects, is uh, the first community in the U.S. to get GPS surveillance systems. Um, so just a little bit of history on what not to take home with you, please.
Youth have been seen as super predators in 1980s, 1990s, and 2000s. Super predators. The great white shark. Um, as AIDS cracked globalization, loss of industry, and the police war on drugs, and immigrants hits neighborhoods, young people fight back, and the roots of organizing movements first sprout in 1985. Los Angeles County builds, built the nation's first comprehensive gang suppression policies. Number one, gang injunctions. First, in 1983, the ability to lock down a neighborhood and arrest people if they are on the street with another, another alleged gang member um, out past the curfew or carrying a cell phone. Uh, number two, gang databases in 1987, computerized lists that labels people as gang members without their knowledge, without any chance of appeal, and without a clear way to get off. Number three, the Statewide Step Act in 1988 that provided the national's first law targeting streets gangs, first gang definition, first language referring to gang members as terrorists, first gang enhancements in court, and took database statewide Cal Gangs database. Number four, in 1985, LA established clear community, law enforcement, and recovery. And just as um, Brother uh, Baruti mentioned, um, the gentleman that's in, um, in prison now, right, after 35 years, and is still being called gang alleged, and then the stuff, this, the, the gang um, accusations that are happening on the inside is the same 15-year-old young man that we went to court for that's looking at 80 to life, right, because of gang enhancements. 35 years ago, still being just claimed to be a gang member, and the violations still happening today with young people. What are the results of LA's multi-billion gang war and drug war? After 25 years, LA has six times as many as gangs and leads twice as many as gang members, and LA's gangs and police policies have spread through the whole world. In the last 30 years, there were more than 100,000 shootings, victims in South Central and Watts alone. In West LA, one out of 78,000 uh, young men are victims of homicide. In East LA, one in 6,100. In South LA, it's one in 2,200. LA County leads the nation and the world in detention, incarceration, and deportation. One in three African American males is under the custody of the state. African Americans are 11% LA's population, but 36 of detention and prison population. Latinos in LA serve five times longer sentences for the same crimes as whites. Latino youth and five times are more likely, and African American youth 18.3 times more likely to receive life without parole than white youth. Law enforcement has inc increasing fear of youth of color, leading to harassment treatment and high numbers of shootings of unarmed people. LA has fueled Cali's, oh, it's okay. Uh, to, uh, 2010 California prison statistics. Cali has 176,000 state prisoners, 40% are from LA County, largest prison population in United States. Uh, California spends over 10 billion a year on prisons. California claims the two largest women's prison in the world. 70% of parolees return to California's prisons for minor, uh, minor parole violations, 70%. There are almost 130 people, 30,000 people of parole in California. Um, and we look at California's prison expansion in the last 30 years. We've built 20 plus prisons. Look at these lands, occupied lands, right? And because of time, I'm gonna try and rush through us. Uh, we're also a part of something called Californians United for a Responsible Budget, and they've contributed to this slideshow. Really trying to shift dollars away from prison spending and shift them into community investments. During that same time, California built one prison, I mean, one university. Number one in prison spending, somewhere between 47 and 50 in education spending.
These are some of our demands. Uh, just 1% of LA's courts, police, sheriff's district, attorneys, probations, probations, and city attorney's budget would just uh, would pay for 500 full gang intervention workers. Uh, 50 youth centers open for 3 p.m. to midnight with a $500,000 budget per youth center. Um, 365 days a year and 25,000 youth jobs. 25,000 youth jobs. What, what does that tell you? That's just 1%. That's a penny out of a dollar. Um, next. Changing the frame from super predator to human being. From gang members to child soldiers. From youth are monsters to the system is monstrous. From punishment works to restorative justice. From youth should be treated like adults to no youth in adult courts, jails, or prisons. <laughs> to the people in charge, we all look the same. Why fight each other? Fight for justice. My name is Radley Davis. My Indian name is Adas Angel. Um, I'm, I come from, my tribe is is called Pit River. Uh, my name means uh, the bark that floats on water and makes many ripples. Our tribal name it means Abalone Shell People. And I'm really inspired by the young p p folks' uh, presentation. It just took my thoughts somewhere else. And I thought about who are you? Do you know who you are? This is what a lot of the youth in our, our home are wondering, who am I? And they can't see clearly. They don't hear correctly. They can't speak how they really would want to speak. They can't feel or walk or touch the things that deep inside what they was born with that I was born with, that I would say you were born with, are trying to get to, who am I? And that is why going to the mountain is so important, not just for my people, because what's going on in my home is going on in other homes across this world, going to the mountain to find your life, to find out who you are, to have that time to not be distracted by a cell phone or a car or even other people, to be able to take the time to walk on the mountain as I have and my sons and my daughters and to see like what we've seen here about what the future could look like, you know, a healthy family. Not being locked up or drunk or beating up somebody or calling somebody names. Without respect, what do you have? What do we got if we've got no respect? My, my people, my elders say nothing. It's a lot of work to do. I, as you relate to the presentations up here, I'm, I'm right with you all. And to know what's been going on today has been happening, it comes from somewhere. My great, great, great grandfather, the late 19 or 1800s, late 1800s, for reasons he does not know, but he survived a march from my country, Pitt River country. They gathered a whole bunch of people and marched them. Marched them from Hat Creek on down to the what they call Highway 44 now. Marched them to a town called Chico. And they marched them all the way down to the San Francisco Bay. 
and they took them out on a ship about five miles out and dumped people over the water into the ocean. And the ones they didn't dump, they came back and marched them to Covalo, where they created a reservation there. In that, my, my grandfather witnessed his mother, who was pregnant, murdered by a United States soldier while they were walking in the wintertime. He witnessed that. He witnessed his father being murdered by another Indian in Covalo because he was messing around with another woman. I sliced them open, cut them open, and laid them on a log. Left them there for everyone to see. He didn't understand that. Until one day, he heard from many other people as they were, I don't know what they were doing, but they seen the tip of Mount Shasta. Northern, Northern California, where I'm from, it's called Ya'aku in our language. They had seen that is home. They know that's their home. And they made plans. And to make a long story short, my grandfather, when he got older, and became a young man, he made his way home. And on his way home, because he didn't have a name, or they didn't know his Indian name, two white men found him when he was walking home and said, it's dangerous for you to be walking as an Indian. You'll get killed. So we're going to name you. We're going to give you a name. And um, they named, they gave, gave him this name. They wrote it on a piece of paper. And um, he didn't know what it meant. And he got home and um, but, he, but he used that paper to, if he did get caught, he got found by one person and he gave him this paper and they let him go because he must have uh, been a, you know, someone owned him. Anyway, but what I'm getting to is that about sacred sites, sacred places, it's just one way to say something that my grandfather through his children, as soon as he got home, he was taken to the mountain, and, he, and then he was married. And he became a powerful Indian doctor, and he lived a long, a long life into, into his 90s. And then he passed that story down. But it's many stories like that from where I'm from and where I've, been, where I've traveled. If we don't go hunting deer, if we don't gather the acorns, if we don't go fishing, if we don't go gather the roots for us, they will go away because they are no longer needed. And this is it's not questioned why. We have to do this. And having that connection to the land and to the mountain and to the springs, it helps become a person. My boys, I believe, are better men because of that. And my daughters are good women because of that. And so we, too, want to live in a, a world without violence and alcohol and drugs and, and trying to figure out how, to, how can we fix this. And so we believe in a spiritual thing that's sometimes hard to talk about. Watu alo in our language means the umbilical cord from the earth to the universe. Watu alo. That's our connection. That's why it's through our mother. We got our spirituality through our mother, according to my tribe. And that's why we have this, uh, why we believe we have this, we have to protect the earth and everything that's a part of it. But I was really inspired by the young folks and the stories, and I want to introduce this, this, this film, right, that we're going to show that will give you a, a brief history, the gold, greed, and genocide about issues in California and some history from uh, some of the, the, the indigenous people from here, the Tonga people from this area. Uh, it's not going to be in the film, but what's where we're at right now? Oh, 